All right, we're here live. This is Allison Crow with the Better Life, Better Work show, and I'm going to do a quick technology check and make sure that we are actually live on the interwebs. Welcome to all the podcast viewers and to our live viewers and replay viewers. Still checking here. Thank you all for your patience. I learned to say thank you instead of I'm sorry. And I'm just going to assume it's working. Let's not even worry about it. It's I'm I don't see it. Oh, yes, I do see it. It's all working. Okay, here we go. We're good to go. Perfect. So today I have with me um, John Steven Cisneros. And I know John as John and Mr. C. <laughs> so I was calculating it somewhere between 15 and 17 years ago, because I started working at St. Austin Catholic School right out of graduate school. Um, and then you came the second year I was there. So you know what you're used to? Okay, so it was 2000. 2000. Oh my gosh. Yep. Okay, yeah. So 17 years ago, okay. we worked together, and John came in to um, a school called St. Austin Catholic School, which was actually a part of my childhood history. And he was the principal. And um, I came from a Baptist school that was rivals. It was another private school in Austin, and it was rivals with. St. Austin's. And so I, when I went to work there as a teacher, I had some preconceived notions about what Catholicism was. Um, and not only when you came in, were you my boss, but I felt like you were a mentor. I remember having conversations with John in the library and asking my questions about Catholicism and kind of butting up against, you know, my beliefs. And you were so able to hold that space. And we, I, I just felt like we had really good conversations. And so I've always considered you a bit of a mentor as well. And then another significant part of my journey um, and I can't, I can't remember, was I a kindergarten teacher when you came and then you asked me to be technology coordinator or was I technology coordinator when you came? Do you remember? I think you were already technology. Okay. I, could, I, could, I know I did teaching for two years in the technology for two and a half years, but I had gone through my divorce and... Um, which all of St. Austin Catholic School had been there when I got married. So my divorce was wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, right after my marriage. And and I'd gone through my divorce. I was just telling one of my coaches this this morning. I was like, yeah, I'm really excited to visit with him on the show because you were such an important part of me being able to go out into the world and start running my own business. Because when I told you I'd gotten my real estate license, you were like, please stay. Will you just stay for a semester? And I kind of negotiated with you. I'd be happy to stay if I can go to this meeting and this meeting and tell everybody I know that I'm going to be leaving it in real estate. And so it, it really actually supported me. You, you, by, by allowing me to do that professionally, you held me as I, in a time where I was very alone and very, um, you know, I never run my own business before. And that structure and that salary <laughs> being the teacher and the freedom to go ahead and step one foot into the new life without any shame or criticism. I don't know that I've ever told you, but that looking back, that support for just that one semester was huge in my success. And then the other funny little thing, I told this to John the other day when we were connecting from my first marriage in 2001, I have two people I remember exactly what they gave me. And one of them is a high school friend. And then John Cisneros gave me a set of stacking bowls from William Sonoma that I still have and still use. And every time I pull them out, I think of you. Um, and then we reconnected on Facebook. And as we've reconnected, we've both seen that we've been on these huge, life changing, very different from who we were 17. 16, 15 years ago. And so I'm excited to um, have John here. I'm going to let John introduce himself and share anything he wants to professionally. I just wanted to share some of the emotional capacity and have loved being connected with him as a, th a thought leader, an educator, someone who is involved and aware of um, I don't want to call it politics, but just awareness of humanity in this world that we live in. And sometimes that comes through, um, I don't even, it, politics is not the right word. Anyways, John, say hi. What do you want people to know about you and who you are? And then we'll dive into stories and journeys. 
There was a, a, a skip in your voice, and I don't know if it's my connection or your connection. Are we okay right now? Yeah, we're good. We're good. It happens. Okay. All right. Just me. So, um, well, it's, let me begin by saying I'm trying to compose myself because you were so very kind and generous with your words and, and reminded me of things that I'd forgotten. And I mm-hmm. think that's part of, of our story, that in some way, you know, we do what we're supposed to do. We do the right things and we send it out to the universe. And uh, there are times like this, these occasions when I'm reminded, you know, John, you weren't so bad all the time. Actually, you did some good things with people. Mm -hmm. And I think that is part of of who I am. And and the ongoing uh, reminder and realization that I know how I can be and I know how I have been. Mm -hmm. Uh, But in the midst of that, there's still, um, I I believe, an intrinsic goodness that is part of just being human. And it's the work to be reminded and say, okay, now go out and do more of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you ask about who I am and and whatever. and, And I think that's a lot of who I am right now. Uh, that so let's go back to that 17 years ago for example if I introduced myself I, with with great pride I would talk about my professional accomplishments uh, having been brought to Austin to be principal of the school uh, it was at the same time it was my intention to enroll at the University of Texas across the street to begin my doctoral studies uh, which I kind of put on the sideline because I got so involved with the school for those uh, five six years um, but it was it was truly as an educator my passion has always been education uh, I I've had the opportunity K through 12 uh, to be uh, uh, primarily an administrator. You know, I was one of those that I was only in the classroom for two years before they said, we're going to put you into administration, uh, which I considered a great compliment and feel very honored by that. Um, But in the midst of that, my, my life was driven by my work. I know there were, you know, in a school setting, you deal with humans a lot. And I tried to deal with them, but for me, it was all about the work because I was competitive and I, I knew that I, I didn't want to be just another school. I wanted to be the best school around, mm-hmm. those kind of things. Yeah. So that was part, not only defined me uh, as person, but it defined me professionally uh, and defined my life. Um, I didn't know how to do relationships because I was so consumed with, with work. I mm-hmm. didn't have time to, to, for another person in my life, uh, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I, I continue to be involved in education. My, my, um, my, my resume is, is, is kind of tweaked a bit. Of course, I finished my doctoral studies there at UT. I, have an oppor- I had an opportunity that brought me to Houston. I, I currently live in Houston, Texas, uh, and love it. I never even wanted to visit Houston, let alone uh, work here. <laughs> and and the, oppor- the opportunity presented itself. And one of my colleagues at UT, where I was at the time, said, you would be a fool not to take that job. Uh, and so I came to Houston within six months. Um, I, I fell in love with Houston, and here I remain. Um, my work in education has changed a little bit. I'm no longer directly involved in administration. I've actually now pretty much concentrated on being an editor and writer. I, I edit dissertations, uh, primarily doctoral students in, in the social sciences, uh, mainly education. Uh, and and uh, I've dealt with uh, students who uh, maybe English isn't their first language. And so I help them with the, the yeah, writing cool. with, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's wonderful to get into their heads and understand a lot of that, which I already know from my own background in education. And there, so that's what I do today. And I love it because I'm sitting, you can't see, all you're seeing is kind of my chest, right? And right. that portrait part of me. But I'm sitting here in my sloppy shorts and I'm kind of working <laughs> the day too. Yeah. And I like that. You know, I, yeah. I haven't worn, I wear a tie very rarely. Uh, that kind yeah, of you were always dressed to the nines. You yeah, did. Yeah. And it's interesting that you see yourself as not relational because I felt like I had a relationship with you. I felt like I could come to you about anything. Um, I also at the time, you know, maybe I was a little naive and I'm, I'm married now to somebody who taught for 30 years and has a lot of opinions about how you relate with administration. And I just always... I, I, I do great with male bosses because I, I can connect with them and I, they don't, they're, I, they're not intimidated. You always let me be me. And I felt like sometimes I was a little more willing to say things that people who are afraid of an administration are afraid of doing something wrong. And my heart was pure. Like if I did something obnoxious, it wasn't because I was trying to be obnoxious. So I always felt like we did have a relationship. But I also remember having, having very high standards and coming into that school and shaping things up and you know, when I drive, it's been a while since I've driven by, but when I drive by, I see the seeds that you planted just in the visibility of the school, the way that it looks, because that, you know, that reflected on the, on the uh, outside. So I, re- I remember you 
I don't know, I guess, because you and I talked about a lot of things. We talked about relationships. You were there when I got married. Um, you or you would bring these meals to us as teachers that you had cooked. And to me, you know, sharing our feet under the table. And it's interesting because I don't see you as, I mean, I see that you were proud and in your work. Um, and, but I felt the relationship aspect of you. And I love that we've both, we've both, you know, there's a lot in between those 17 years, but how, Ryan, I'm sitting here in my shorts too. And the rest of my office, you can't see that's all messy. And my dogs are, I'm hoping they're not about to bark at the pool guy because he just got here, but trying to keep those guys calm. So um, the other thing I do remember about you from them, and I'm excited to kind of hear, and I want you to just be able to tell a little bit of your personal story, but you were very, you were very, I don't know what the word is, but you were very much in your Catholic faith. And we had a lot of discussions about that because that was new for me. But I felt like you, like you stood up straight in the Catholic faith. And I want to introduce this concept of quilted spirituality because at the time I was very much standing up in my Christian non-denominal national faith. And I've since broadened. I didn't necessarily exclude that, but I've added other things. So I'd love to hear a little bit of your journey and the way that you want to tell it, um, but also including that quilted spirituality. Sure. Thanks. I, and I love that term. And it's certainly not my own term. It was something I heard along the way. And it, that's an example of hearing things and saying, aha, that's it. Because so, you know, being born and raised Catholic and all that. And part of my story does include that for 12 years, um, I was a, what they call a professed religious. I was a brother. I was not in seminary to be a priest. Uh, it would have been comparable to uh, you know, a nun, uh, uh, but a male. Uh, so we were brothers and we primarily operated schools around the country. So that was where I got my foothold in, in education as and my training and my background and uh, and a lot of my style reflected that that particular lifestyle and, and that training. Uh, and I, you know, and I, I carried that with honor. And in some ways, I still do, because they gave me they defined for me a work ethic and a, a sense of commitment to what you are doing uh, that I'd like to think I still possess. However, it was all couched and, and, and within the, the, the traditional Catholic Church. And. And I, I do, I think part of my personality, I love rituals. I'm romantic. So mm -hmm. part of being romantic is that I appreciate rituals, that on certain days you do this and certain days you do that. Um, you know, when there's something special in your life, you celebrate it, however. Um, so that, that part of the, the Catholic tradition spoke to me, um, you know, whether it was uh, Easter or uh, different saints. You know, there was those rituals and, and, and what they represented, not so much the theology, because I oftentimes had issues with the theology, because a lot of times it says that this is the only way. Mm -hmm. And I said, mm, I'm not convinced that it's the only way, but it's one way of me. You know, I see you have on your glasses right now. Um, I have on contacts and I had to realize that I needed prescription lenses for me to view the world more clearly. Mm -hmm. And so for a number of years, it was the Catholic tradition, uh, traditions and practices that allowed me to have a clearer view of the world and my place in it. Um, you know, my experience as a child going to Catholic schools was not, I don't have those horror stories. Sure. Uh, my, you know, my families were very, my family was very involved in my parents. So we had all these nuns around us because I'm old enough where we actually had nuns in school and they were very kind to us. Uh, so I don't have a lot of those horror stories. I can't, but it did teach me about what it meant to be of service to others. Uh, mm -hmm. It did teach me about the value of education and, uh, you know, kind of a, a moral compass. Uh, so I, you know, I, I carried that tradition forward. But as I got older, especially after St. Austin's was the last Catholic institution where I worked. And part of that was a realization that, OK, John, you're playing the role. Right. I was playing the role. Mm -hmm. When you talk about me standing straight in that faith tradition, <laughs> well, I had enough respect that I was not in any way going to be disrespectful. Absolutely. While on the in, but on the inside, there were certain things that, oh my gosh, this is, you know, this is just I would the biggest never pilot have, crap. I would yeah. never have known oh, that yeah. at the time. I would never have known that. And, and I remember and see, feeling was, similar, right? Because I wasn't Catholic, but I, you know, I would have to, I would, when I, especially when I taught kindergarten, I would participate 
in the way, you know, I would participate in all the rituals and, you know, we had to cross our, because I'm not Catholic, I had to cross my arms at communion. So, and I remember the same thing, like having the respect, but never in my mind would I have thought you were going, this is a load of crap. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. So there were, and there were many things that I knew that we had to do because it was a school and that was our point and our purpose. But, um, uh, you know, when I was off duty, it was certainly not part of my life. Um, (laughs) And, 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 you know, and, and that was, that was a conflict, you know, that was internal conflict because at that time in my life, I think this is a perfect opportunity for me to talk about this idea that that was a, that was a perfect example of how my life was so segmented. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, it's Catholic and you're going to play Catholic from uh, yeah. 7 a.m. until 4 or 5 or 7 p.m., whatever time that parents meeting is over, because you are the exemplar of Catholicism. Mm-hmm. So you're going to play Catholic as best you can. Yeah. And so I did that. But then after that hour and when I was on my own time, that I was I was someone else. Mm-hmm. Right. And then when I would go home and visit my family in San Antonio, my parents were still alive at that time yeah. or my mom was. Yeah, I, your was, mom some, was. I was someone else. Yeah. And so throughout my, you know, when I looked at any given 24 hour period, oh, John probably had, um, you know, three or four personalities. And, and that, you know, that was, it was getting tiring to kind of keep up with which personality, which persona I was supposed to be playing at that hour of the day. You know, Let me pause. How... Go, ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. And then I want to pause. I want to, I want to just kind of put a flag in here for our listeners, but I want you to finish your thought. Okay. And, and so, so for me, that was a uh, beginning of this journey. When you talk about these 17, 15 and 17 mm-hmm. years, that journey of, um, I think that the most simple word is authenticity yeah. to be authentic. And what did that mean for me? Um, yeah. yeah, perfect. Okay. This is what I love. This is really what the better life, better work show is all about what I'm all about. I know, you know, I have so many different ways that I phrase it and, and in what my work is about helping do. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on this show was because of all the other ways that people, the ways that we segment ourselves, the ways that we other ourselves, the ways that we put ourselves in these roles and the way, and and because we do that, we stifle the authentic part of ourselves. And to me, better life. So that's what I want to ask my people like, like, that are listening, anybody that's listening is just take a moment and check in with your heart and your breath. And I'm not saying you have to do anything about it right now, but just notice with a loving heart where you might be segmenting yourself so that you feel safe or feel like for me, it was acceptance. I just wanted to feel accepted. I wanted to feel loved and accepted. I wanted to feel appreciated. And um, everybody has their different reasons um, for doing it. But just take a moment and check in. Where am I segmenting myself? Where am I cutting off? And you think about segment, right? Like I'm actually going back to eighth grade, cutting up animals um, in biology. Like you, you cut off a part of your life force energy and who you are. So I just wanted to throw that in there for the audience. And now I want to come back to you, John, tell us about this was was so fun because like, I don't talk to you or see you for years. And all of a sudden there's Facebook and I'm like, Oh, John Stevens Cisneros looks a little happy, <laughs> different man yeah. than I knew a long time ago. So let's hear about well, this story. And so you know, so so if we use Austin as that kind of springboard uh, yeah. and uh, that multi. Uh, I can't think of the right term I want to think of, but that segmented life for, be- yeah. for lack of a better term. Yeah, that's a great. You know, term. I was playing. I was you know, I was Sybil. I was Sybil. You know, depending on how the sun was shining and the light was shining, you were going to see somebody different at, at different times. Um, and so, for example, I, I, and I grew up with this idea that, you know, we needed to live a good life so that we could have this here, life hereafter. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and that was kind of my orientation. And I said, ah, there's, that's just, and, you know, being educated and smart and, and I love to read a lot. I said, mm, there's just too many other thoughts out there and too many thinkings and that are well founded for me just to exclude anything except this. So, for example, this notion of religion um, mm-hmm. and, and all the conflict that went on with that. Once upon a time, I came across, uh, across um, one of the sayings uh, attributed to the Dalai Lama when he is questioned, says, well, what is your religion? And the Dalai Lama says, my religion is kindness. Mm -hmm. To be kind, it is kindness. I said, that's it. It's not about the trappings of a particular dogma or theology, but, you know, it is is a fidelity to something. 
and the fidelity to be faithful to is kindness. Mm -hmm. And then there's another, I forget that it, it's, a, I want to say it's a, a Greek philosopher. Um, and I forget the name off the top of my head, but you know, it's uh, about this notion of kindness is be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a great battle. Mm -hmm. And I said, yep. And so for example, the word kind and kindness, it started to appear in different places uh, that wasn't strictly religious. Uh, it might have been a philosopher. It might have been, you know, the Dalai Lama. It might have been another Buddhist. Uh, it, you know, it's, I mean, I have some wonderful friends who are atheists. And, mm -hmm. and so it had nothing to do with any of those kinds of beliefs. It had to do with a compass that drove their lives and what they, you know, how they, how we interact with the world. And, mm -hmm. and bottom line for me is how we find connection, how I find connection. Yes. Because when I was playing the role of that Catholic school principal, uh, I was trying to find connection. Mm -hmm. And when people tried to get close to me, I would back off because I said, oh, no, because if you get if I allow you to get close to me, you're going to find someone that really isn't real. Yeah. Right. Because what you're yeah. seeing is this, this well-crafted facade. But mm -hmm. I'm certainly not going to let you to come inside of me because mm -hmm. if I allowed you in, you would, you would, mm -mm, no, I didn't like me. Right? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't like love me. and accept me. Exactly. How right. could you love and accept me if I don't love and accept yep. me? Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. And, and, you know, and you know what I did, Allison? So with all that stuff in my head, which was funny for me, I, I laugh at this today because I led a privilege, a pretty uh, charmed and privileged life. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's education, whether it's family background, whether it's socially, economically, whatever, I, you know, I thought I was okay, but I was so miserable on the inside. I went out and drank a lot. Yeah. Like I used to think of, you know, how, how regularly, I, I mean, very regularly, you know, I, I, I drank and of course I got in trouble for it. I mean, I mm -hmm. had to deal with the law and I ended up with a, you know, a couple of DWIs and, uh, and now I'm in recovery. I will say mm -hmm. up front that, you know, but it took me 28 years to address that. Mm -hmm. And part of that was, you know, that was my quest because I was trying to find an escape where I said, God, I, there must be some place where I'm going to be okay. Yeah. Uh, and of course, and it would numb everything, right? By yeah. drinking, it would numb everything. Num numbing. Um, because the truth is, you know, I went to church very regularly and I said, okay, if there's this God thing, I'll go to church regularly and it's going to take care of. You know, I should not feel the inter the internal mm -hmm. turmoil as I'm feeling and experiencing it. Isn't I just that didn't interesting get that. how many places in quote religion. It was funny. I was watching uh, my DVR TV show. One of these, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Grey's Anatomy, and the same thing happened to my sister because you you were around when Blythe was born. Blythe is 15 years old now. Oh you my gosh! Oh she's my so gosh! Cute. She's in ninth grade. She's going. She's finishing eighth grade. Um, and you were, I remember coming to you when we found out Blythe was diagnosed with this condition and it, you know, it's, it's rocked our whole family, but my sister for years, you know, she ended up having three kids in three years and one with this major disability. And at the time, the church that she went to told her, cause this, you know, if you pray, she will be healed, right? Mm -hmm. If we go to church, it will take care of all that. And so even something like, you know, it's not just, drinking that numbs us that's just the one that they have recovery groups for and we already know about but there's things like facebook and shopping and religion being a number like nobody thinks oh religion just keeps you from looking at the truth it can it can be beautiful and it can totally keep you numb um and it's just fascinating to me how many places were taught if if you do this religious thing then everything will be okay and that's just not life. <laughs> I'm no, just no, going to no. say it's just not life. I'm not saying religion is terrible and it's not just life. So I love this. Like when I imagine the quilt, I imagine the threads that, you know, I've actually made quilts before, but I imagine the threads, the stitching is the kindness. The stitching is the connection, the stitching and, and the little pieces are all. And that's what's so beautiful about, I have a girlfriend that made a prayer quilt and there's so many different patterns and there's so many different um, pieces. It's not just one, one piece of fabric, so many different pieces and it's all stitched with kindness and connection. Mm -hmm. And in education, all the things that, I, so, you know, in learning and studying, I remember reading a book. I have a book upstairs by this woman named Starhawk and she's a witch. 
and it's the goddess spirituality. And I start reading this and I'm like, this is the shit they told me in Baptist school. Like that was evil and from the devil. And it's the oldest spirituality that and shamanism are the oldest religions around like way before. And it doesn't. And then you start hearing about like, um, some of the other religions that have the same number of sacraments. And, and even right now I'm watching and I'm reading the book Outlander and watching the show. And it's so interesting in the Scottish and the English in the war where the, they take things like um, Samhain and turn it into Halloween. Um, the Christians took, you know, took these pagan. Um, right. And it's funny because I like that word kind of scares me to say I'm pagan, but I realize my beliefs are pretty much pagan. <laughs> I mean, if you had to put a label on it and, but the old Baptist kid in me is like, you're going to hell. Um, but like you, one of my friends, Nikki, one time said, um, I don't want to be a part of something that excludes everything else. And to me, that's the definition of kindness is yep. that, you know, it's not that this religion is wrong and it excludes everything else. So I'm just, I want to open up and be more inclusive and find out what we have in common instead of what the other person is doing wrong. And my biggest, my biggest is try to do that for the people who are still excluding. <laughs> That's my challenge. Yeah. 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 So um, redemption, tell us where, did, how did you get to where you are now? How did you get from that stuffy uptight um, segmented man to this person that I, Anybody who can find joy in living in Houston, Texas, the way you do, which is a whole nother story of how that inspires me since I live in Denton now. Um, but you do, you have, I know that some people on Facebook BS and they're putting up, but I can, I read energy and I can feel the energy of your joy. And then we had an exchange a couple of years ago about how your life has changed. So tell us about your journey to authenticity and redemption. Well, I, and it's all a matter of, of this segmented, segmented life. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I just, I think I was literally emotionally exhausted of trying to keep track of it all. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had to hit a bottom, so to speak. Um, and for me, it was, it was a part of it was professional. So, you know, I came to Houston for this nice job, a uh, very nice position at the largest school district in the state of Texas. And of course, they, you know, and, and I used to play in my head this tape that uh, the district has 29,000 employees, but they brought me from Austin. Mm -hmm. So that should tell you something yeah. about who I am, right? Yeah, it was so good. That, that, yeah. Tape, yeah, that tape played in my head. I said, but isn't that funny, John? You think you're so special, but yet on the inside, you really don't like yourself. Mm. And, and that, um, and honestly, that's what brought me into recovery mm -hmm. uh, because I just, you know, I, it, was, it, it just was not happening. And when I came into recovery, um, it was the experience of realizing that, you know, John, you're, you're okay, but it isn't everything that, that it's not your outside that has defined you. Mm -hmm. And it, that was began that journey inside. I didn't know what joy was. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't know what compassion was. Um, if, if, the, if I was in charge of a, a group organization or school and we had um, a crisis in the community, I knew how to have uh, the appropriate, and I use that word intentionally, the appropriate uh, celebration or the appropriate memorial. It was very nicely done. Uh, that whether it was the flowers, whether it was the music, whether it was the decorations in the hall, um, every, you know, just and even the words that were used, mm -hmm. it was all very appropriate. But I really didn't feel for your loss. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel for your, you know, that you have gained something in in a marriage. I just knew, oh, it's going to be a, a lovely. And I used to love to use that word. This is going to be a lovely party, uh, because but it was it was the appropriate thing. And it wasn't until I had to little, it was like an onion, that little by little layer. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so I'm going to, you know, my divine source said, I'm going to take away your job and let's see how you do. Uh, and by the way, because of the trouble you got into, your license is going to be suspended. So you won't be able to drive. Let's see how you get around, Mr. Fancy Pants. Um, <laughs> and, and then, um, and then it was, uh, yeah, those are the two biggies, right? It was, mm -hmm. and it was all that external stuff. And because you don't have that fancy job, uh, you know, your income, how, what are you going to do to, to make a living and survive? Mm -hmm. um, and so that fancy townhouse, you know, you're going to have to give that up 
and move into something much more modest. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was all those layers one by one. Thank God it didn't all happen at the same time. Yeah. It happened over a period of about 14 months. Um, but th that was that lit literally that was what the universe had to uh, do to me, so to speak, for me to begin to say, you know what? I can do this without that crutch. Um, you know, nobody could, nobody gave a rat's ass whether I was a doctor or not, right? Uh, because I used to make sure that when I was introduced, you will always introduce me as a doctor right. once, I became a do <laughs> once I became a doctor. And so that kind of nonsense. Uh, and so, you know, then all of a sudden, well, you just certainly don't have a job to go with that, so who cares? And so that it was that kind of thing. Um, you know, I talk about the joy in my life and the bicycle. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so I couldn't, I couldn't drive, right? Yeah. And I live very convenient. Uh, I'm in what they call North Montrose, so I'm very convenient to pretty much every anything. I can walk down the, a block and have a burger. What is it? A Jack in the Box, where there are two tacos for a dollar or whatever it is. Or I can go <laughs> an extra block and eat it and eat at a restaurant where the, the you know the uh, appetizer is thirty five dollars mm -hmm. and everything in between. So, and I love that up uh, the diversity of of all the opportunity in this area. So I was very lucky to be living in the area. But even with that, it was the idea I said, okay, John, but you know, to get around and do this, that, and the other. Uh, and so I got a bike. I've always had a bike. That's mm -hmm. part of what I grew up with. So I, I, that wasn't the problem. But I'll never forget, Allison. I live ten minutes from downtown, and I said, I'm going to ride downtown. And I said, I'm sorry, three miles. And I said, I'm going to ride downtown. And because I just thought it was this big deal to ride up, take a bike ride downtown. And then I came back the next day and was talking to people and said, I'm sorry, what's the big deal about it? You're only 10 minutes away. Right. I said, oh, yeah, that's right. So then the following weekend, I went a little further and then a little further. Uh, so last weekend, I went with a friend of mine. We went to Galveston for the day and I-45 was shut down. So we had to take the alternate route, which is the old Galveston Road from my front door to the front door of uh, NASA is 25 miles. And that's a Sunday ride for me. Oh, awesome. You know, that, and yeah. that happened over time. And so the yeah. joy came realizing that nobody gave me a ride, that on my own resources of what I have been gifted, you know, that, that you know, and I, and I will be 59 in a few days. And so not being this young kid anymore, that I could still go out and, 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 and just physically have that experience. Right. Uh, so, you know, wow. And that was a lot of it says, you know, John, just do it. Because I didn't have the crutches of, of social or economic security. A lot of it was, you know, John, just do it. Hmm. Just do it. And I discovered that, oh, my gosh, I even got friendlier, you know, riding the bus to talk to people on the bus uh, and said, you know, John, you can have a conversation, even though that person kind of looks homeless. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> it's it. And that was the idea of just finding that connection, regardless of where I was. Hmm. And then like the bike thing. There's one of the bike shops I deal with has on their wall, they have these different little saints from some of their customers. And one of them, I just love, it says, uh, um, I love the view of the world from the seat of my bike. Mm. Because by being exposed to all of the elements and seeing everything to, you know, on the side of the road, it gave me an appreciation for the world like I never had before. Yeah. Because it was so, certainly much easier to hop in the car with the windows rolled up and just go about my merry way. Mm -hmm. And and again, that exposure to the world, it, it gave me a sense of connection, everything I never had. So there became great joy when all of a sudden, oh, my God, I remember that lot that was vacant. And look what they've done to that because they, they had just they built a new house and then the landscaping around it to appreciate that, which I would appreciate it kind of uh, as I drove by. But to just either be walking or biking by uh, the appreciation of everything. Uh, the, the, you know, even the homeless, which we have a lot of here in Houston, that, that, that awareness of what their life is about, et cetera. Um, and that, that, that transcends religion. That has mm -hmm. nothing to do with anything I would believe, but it has everything to do with how my soul is connected with mm -hmm. other. Because all of my life, I felt a sense of otherness. You know, I'm not going to let you know me because I'm just not like you and you wouldn't get it. And you wouldn't like it. Um, I, I never felt I belonged. I didn't feel I fit in. Right. And so that it was, it was a lot of it was very physical for me. A lot of it was very visual, what I could see, what I could. And I realized I've always been that way in my life. I'm very sensate, very sensual. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's part of being a romantic, right? Yeah. Where I love to touch and have an experience of the world around me. Well, it's the embodiment as, of the change too, right? Cause yep. we can have a change up here, but if we're not embodying it, 
if it's not, and sometimes the embodiment happens. So we do this in coaching sometimes, like if you don't feel it, sometimes your body says move and you will feel it like action. What is the science? Um, you know, the energy creates energy. So right. if we, right. So, but the embodiment of it too. Okay. Keep going. This is amazing. So, yeah. So it's, you know, it, it, a lot of it with those experiences, um, I began to work a little bit with these clients. And so academically, I was still being, and I love the scholarship of that because it kept yeah. my brain going. Yeah. But it was the other part. Um, I've always loved music, for example, and here in Houston. And again, this is a city that I didn't want to be in. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but we have Rice University and the Shepherd School of Music and all, everything those students do. It, it, it's the highest quality and it's free. Yeah. I said, you know, and, and I would buy, and, and, and I was on the bicycle and, and Houston is pretty hot and muggy. So I was sweaty and I said, oh, my gosh, just go and sit in there. And nobody again, it was that, you know, you walk into this nice concert hall and I'm all sweaty and I'm this nice dark Latino because I had that complex. That was the other thing. I have a complex because our group and the family where I was the darkest one. And as I was spending more time outdoors, getting more tan, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, my 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 self conscious was also, oh my God, John, you're getting darker. What, what mother is rolling in her grave right now mm -hmm. because of the, she was always so protective of that. But and so I would walk into this very nice environment, this lovely lovely campus and concert hall. No one gave a rat's ass what I look like, and I could sit there and just enjoy that music. Because, so all those preconceived notions of what you know, how I should be dressed or I should be clean shower. And granted, I like to be presentable, but in general, those are all that baggage that I carried in my head. While the world outside mm -hmm. me was saying, "Just come, John. Just come and be present with us. Mm -hmm. Come and celebrate what this is all about." We may not have matching napkins. We may have the cheapest paper plates from the dollar store. But the fellowship you are going to experience mm. and the sense of connection is what you have been questing and get over your cheap self. You know, I keep telling, I've often told myself, John, get over your cheap self and just do mm. it. And it's amazing by doing that, the connections I have made. You know, for example, I found it so funny that I was at a, a scholarship dinner gala thing two weeks ago for one of the universities and the mayor was there. Well, I have been into so many different functions in the last year or so, two years since he's been elected, that, you know, he, he knows who I am and we always take a picture and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, how interesting, because the first time I ever encountered that man, I had ridden my bike downtown. I was good and sweaty. And I said, <laughs> I don't care. Just take a picture. You know, he's the, the new mayor. He just had been elected. I said, he's a new mayor. I want a picture with him. And it was just, I said, isn't that funny that I've gotten over my cheap self enough just to put myself out there? Right? Mm. And by putting myself and it's not that I, you know, I'm forceful because I used to be very forceful to make sure you knew who I was. Right. But I don't have to do that just by being myself uh, that I, you know, I'm out and about and, and it's all about it's all about connection for me, Allison. Mm. Uh, it's about not only, you know, with with myself, the connection with myself, right? the connection with the universe around me and mm. the connection with others, yeah. um, you know, and it, but it starts with myself. You know, there's this thing that like like prayer and meditation, and I've done some stuff with that. Um, and it was really like, let's go back to like sitting in church. God, it would just drive me crazy to have to sit there for an hour. <laughs> but part of it was because I was so uncomfortable with myself to mm -hmm. sit in quiet, to yeah. sit in quiet with myself. And so solitude, one of the, the, the spiritual writers that I read once had, in one of his meditations talked about, you know, solitude is his time alone. And the truth is, who wants to spend time alone? with the person they dislike the most. Mm -hmm. I yeah. said, oh my God, John, that's why I can't sit in solitude. Mm -hmm. I could never sit still because if I sat still, the only person with me was me and ugh, I didn't want to be with myself. Right. And so it was, that, it was that journey of discovering myself. Um, and that quilted spirituality thing was just reading all these, like this meditation thing, which was not a Catholic uh, a, a piece of literature. I don't even know who wrote it, but there it was. And all these pieces come together and say, you know, it's about who I am, discovering myself, being authentic to myself, um, the sense of other, being aware of other, but not feeling otherness. Right. Right, better not above other. or beneath um they're mm -hmm. one of my you know i am above no one i am beneath no one i am independent yeah. of the good and bad opinions i am courage i am love is yep, one of the mantras that helped me courage. That. courage courage i love that courage and love so for me part of that courage was it's okay john just do it it'll be okay 
and you and I had the conversation that so for again when we first met, uh, one of the you know one of the personal or personas I had was dealing with my own sexuality, mm-hmm. right? And when I was twenty five and a young uh, young teacher and a young principal, nobody questioned that. I said, oh, he's young. He's you know he's still you know feeling his oats. He'll get married or whatever and settle down. When I got to be fifty, he's never been married. You've never been married, and there were all these you know kind of curiosities, and and I began to look at that. Said, you know, John. You can't, you can't even hide from yourself anymore. You've got it. And, and that was a double life I led because Lord knows I was certainly um, living out my sexuality in one segment of my life, but it wasn't part. Right. See, I would never, I would never have, and I always, you know, I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but it doesn't matter. I'm just going to be like, I always had a good gaydar. Right. And I, to this day, I have very good gaydar. And yet in my mind, well, no, I, I kind of thought of you as asexual, like, like, and maybe it was the, the Catholic, like just this not, and I remember ask, I probably, we asked you, I don't remember any specific conversations, but you know, I do remember your affinity for really nice things. I knew your relationship with your mother, but no, you turned. So here's what I, what I'm able to do is I'm able to read people's energy. I didn't know that at the time, but you did a very good job of turning that energy completely off. You segmented it. If you were, if you were living that in one segment of your life, you did not bring that energy into the doors, the events, the, even the weekend things that sometimes St. Austin would do. You didn't bring that in. And and part of that, again, at the heart of that was that um, I I just didn't know what that meant. And especially in the, in the, in the, uh, the confines of the Catholic church and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, but then despite the church thing, I was still living my life uh, even after I stopped going to church and all that. Um, it, w- it was still segmented. Houston, that's a part of Houston. Houston is rather progressive. And I didn't want to be here because I thought it was just this redneck, racist town. And I was, I've, I've just been pleasantly, pleasant and very, very grateful that it's really not that way. Yeah. Um, and so I come here and I said, you know, John, if you're really going to be whole, if you're really going to be whole, and authentic that is a part of who you are yeah um, and I, I did go i remember going here we have the rothko chapel which uh-huh. is near the uh, if you've heard and it's just it's you know it's just really really cool place and i sat in there and i remember talking out loud i said okay i don't know who the hell you are I don't know, and, I, <laughs> and i'm not and i'm not going to try and figure this out i'm not going to try and define you i i don't know who the hell you are but i'm going to tell you this you made this and it's mm-hmm. good Yes. And so I need to use it. I need to maximize it for my purposes of being whole. Mm -hmm. And part of being whole then is to use it to be of service to others. Beautiful. And that's, and that was it. Everything that I'm about is say, you know, John, like being smart, you're being smart, John, but you can't, don't be cocky. How do you use it to be of service to Mm -hmm. others? You know, and, and not even necessarily professionally, um, but for example, uh, I, I mentioned I'm in recovery, and specifically, I participate in AA. So there's these, you know, there's AA all over the place, and a lot of people in AA um, socially they they are a little awkward. Let me just say it that way. And so I feel because of the blessings of my life or the good fortune of my life, whether it was the way I was raised or because of my training professionally or whatever, that I have enough social grace that it is incumbent upon me. So John, get over your cheap face your chief self and go and say, hello, <laughs> you extend your hand first. And so mm-hmm. just that kind of hospitality to say, yeah. hey, I don't know that I've met you. Nice that you're here. You know, keep coming back. Yeah. Uh, that's one example. That's very simple. That again, that, you know, that because of what I have, the good fortune that has been mine, how do I use that to be kind, mm-hmm. right? To be hospitable. And that's all it is. You know, it's kind not, of- it's not, hey, I'm, you know, bring, let me bring you to dinner or whatever. It's, it's not that. Um, you know that um, I was never in all my drinking days, I was never 86th from a bar, but I have been 86th from a laundry and cleaners, the dry cleaners, because I was such a, a bitch of a customer oh, at this wow. one particular dry cleaners. When I went in there, about my buttons and my collars and my cuffs, how they were starched or not starched to meet oh, my wow. standards. They actually said, you know, take your business elsewhere. And to think, uh, so today I'm very conscious of whether I'm at the local grocery store, which is Kroger or HEB, mm-hmm. uh, the dry cleaner that I deal with, uh, any any place I go, the CVS, et cetera. Um, I, you know, John, get over your cheap self. And how do you take, you know, take the first step 
to be kind and hospitable. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my life, I think about being hospitable, hospitality, right. and how do I extend that? Um, and to me, that is that is spirituality. So when I talk about a quilted spirituality, at the heart of spirituality, the spirituality is connection. Mm-hmm. Right? Spirituality is connection. And, and yet so you how, can't. And, Go ahead. Sorry, you can get excited. I'm just excited. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. um, so and, and so you know again, I, and I, I uh, I'm eligible for a driver's license and all that stuff. All those consequences. That's all behind me. But I still haven't gotten a driver's license <laughs> because I love my life. I yeah. love. I just love it. You know, I'm at the age now where I'm also becoming eccentric. Yeah. So, oh my God. This, and I get honked at all over the place. And, you know, <laughs> they say, oh hey John, and I really like, you know that's part of joy in my life, and it's the joy because oh my gosh. You know, if I counted them on a daily basis, all it is at the end of the day is a reminder. See, John, by just being yourself, people love you and you've connected with them. And what more is there? You know, I, you know, I don't care what European car I was driving or what piece of uh, fancy, whatever stemware I was driving. I remember, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the Baccarat crystal, but before I threw them against the wall and busted them, that, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that cost a hundred dollars a piece. And I thought I was so special, but, you know, I was throwing them against the wall because I was so miserable. Mm-hmm. Whereas today I don't have that, but you wa- I walk around and there it is. And, you know, Alison, even walking around the neighborhood here, I'm very, very conscious when I walk down the sidewalk, I see someone approach me. I look them straight on yeah. because, you know, it is, people often, they look down, yep. they, they cast do their too, eyes yeah. down. Yeah. And I still say hello. I still, yeah. and some will respond. One man almost fell over because, oh my God, there's another human being talking to me. Yeah. But th- that's, that, that is the essence. And so what has that meant? Not only uh, just socially in the neighborhood, um, what it means to, you know, there's, uh, there's a vacant lot across where I live. They had uh, torn down the old bungalow. They're going to put up a townhouse, but it's been a while. And so we have a lot of yuppies in the area now with dogs. And so they come and there's a couple of them that have these puppies that they're training. Mm -hmm. And so I remind myself of my dad now because I'll go out there and strike up a conversation and just to talk about what, how they're training them, what, what their goal is. And I told them that, you know, but my little dog used to be a bilingual. (laughs) And and so we say, and I said, isn't that funny? There is there, I may never see that person again. There's nothing that they can give me quote unquote, uh, and I may not be able to give them, but in the midst of that, it's making that connection. And I go to bed at night and I said, oh my God, this has been an awesome day. And mm-hmm. I can feel myself smiling right now yeah. because I do that. You know, I, you know, so let's go back to 17 years ago. That little school had a yearbook. Yeah. I challenge you with the last dollar in my pocket to go and go through pages, page through those yearbooks and find a picture of me. There's always the, you know, where the principal has that picture in the beginning. I, mm-hmm. I had to take that one, right? That school picture. But in between, there are all the activities and things you would never, you, you're very, very rarely, if ever, going to find a picture of me because I didn't want to see myself. Mm-hmm. And today, you know me, and people tell me, gosh darn, John, you are always posting on Facebook. I love selfies. And wherever and I am. I was just telling somebody that the other day, like somebody was slamming selfies and I was like, do you know how long it took for me to love this self? Uh And that's why I'm sharing it. And so this is the connection that I'm really hearing from you. Kindness. You had to be kind to you to genuinely be kind to somebody else. You had to love and connect with yourself before you genuinely loved and connected. And until you did those things to yourself, until we give to ourselves, and a lot of the world calls that selfish. I call it self-centered. Like, so it's okay to think about ourselves. It's okay to love ourselves. It's okay to desegment and own ourselves. We can't, we're not giving anything pure. So I don't care how, like, like you, you're this is a perfect example of someone who gave to the community, who made everything look good, but it was an empty vessel, uh, pretty mm-hmm. on the outside, but didn't give a shit on the inside because you didn't give a shit about yourself. And there's so many people that we wonder, well, I'm doing this and I'm volunteering here and I'm doing all this. Why am I miserable? Because you're not giving yourself because we've been taught. And this is one of the things that I think a lot of religions do is they teach you that God is outside of you and that you're nothing without God. And I personally believe that God is me and that God is in me. And that's what the love is. And so when I can be kind to myself, 
the kindness that I extend to you is genuine. It's not so that you'll like me. Just like, I love it. We just were in Mexico and at the beach, it's like all calm and quiet and people mind their business. But at the pool where the pool bars are, you start, you make friends with everybody that's there. You have these amazing conversations. And like you said, you don't need anything from them. You're not trying to do business, nothing. You're just enjoying sitting at the pool and talking with these people from all over the world. We had so much fun meeting these interesting people and just connecting. It was, yeah. So this, this giving to yourself, that kindness, giving to yourself the permission, which I think permission is funny because I think of all the Catholic places you landed, St. Austin's would have been really cool with you being gay because clearly you're right. They were right. (laughs) right. The person that came in after you was a teacher and she'd been out for years. And then she ended up taking your, your position and she was gay and had a partner and all this other stuff. So I just, I, you know, but, but that's the thing you you have to give it to yourself. You, you, You know, you didn't ask for it for yourself at the time. You know, you're talking about all that, like being an empty vessel, et cetera. One of the other words that I had to deal with that I continue to deal with is the word humility. Mm -hmm. Right. And I came upon the definition of humility a few years ago, which reads, humility is a clear recognition of what and who I am with a sincere attempt to become what I can be. Mm. And just that first part, a clear recognition of what and who I am. And so all the things that I was denying about myself, especially being gay, um, that was that wasn't how it was false humility by mm-hmm. acting some other way, and you know which was a pile of crap, right. right? As opposed to truly being authentic and and saying you know what that is me, and so that's another thing. So what do I do with that? I don't I, you know I'm I don't think I appear, obviously appear as this big you know flaming whatever which may be common <laughs> in some circles. That's not that's just You're not just me, and I'm not you. trying to hide yeah. anything anymore. I'm just being me. But I do believe I have an opportunity, and this is where like for example like being doctor, uh, with some of the, the, with some of the um, social issues going around, uh, I say, yes, put me on the list as a supporter and make sure you put doctor. Yeah. Because it's one of the things that, you know, that someone who, uh, so to speak, has a social credentials, a social capital, uh, and they, they are supporting this particular cause. And if I can do that and be of service, I will do that. I don't mm-hmm. expect people to call me doctor anymore. I'm okay with that. I, I really am. But there are certain times I say, you know, John, use it for, because it'll, it'll, it'll support the cause. Um, yeah, it's a great, it's and, a, and it's that, a key to get in a door and, and that's the thing. It's, it's a key to get in the door and then you have your heart to give once you're, once you're in the door, so to yeah, speak too. Yeah. Exactly. You know, um, someone might look because of the name, but they'll find so much more than is, than is the doctor. They'll find so much more when they're able to see your heart. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there was something else I was thinking. I, I lost, um, you talked about redemption, yeah. and 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 that was that whole thing about you know making things new again. That's another one of the mm-hmm. themes that I think is right now a part of my life. Um, and and let me let me let me share a couple things of uh, what it looks like. Okay. So I had not been to San Antonio in eight years, um, more than eight years, and about three weeks ago, because there's Fiesta Week in San Antonio, mm-hmm. right, every year, and I thought, you know, gosh, I'd like to go, and I didn't want to do a lot of the stuff. But for whatever reason, I was thinking of lunchtime. Uh, I would go with like my my folks, or I'd go with some friends, and we would go at lunch to the market, where you really got just the, fest- the festive air was mm-hmm. enough to say fiestas fiestas going on. And and I also had a client that was in San Antonio who just defended her dissertation at UT in Austin, and I'd never met her in person. Uh, a lot of my clients, I don't know, uh, I deal with them email, t- you know how that goes. Yeah. Right? Um, so anyway, so I had never met her. But as we've talked about it, where she is a principal to school, I was so impressed with it. I said, God, I would love to see it and tour it. And I said, you know what, if there's a way and there's this mega bus, which I hear about. So I <laughs> called and all this kind of for eight bucks. So for eight bucks, <laughs> so you didn't ride I, your I, bike to Houston. No, to San Antonio. Or um, to San Antonio so, from Houston. So I, um, um. I said, I'm going to go and I'm going to have lunch at the market. Then I'm going to go by uh, this, you know, this principal school and tour the school. And then I'm going to get the bus back to Houston. And that's all I wanted to do. But I thought maybe my brother who was there, my brother and sister-in-law, maybe I could uh, hook up with them for lunch and they could join me at the market. So uh, my brother said yes. 
He said, but actually, he says, you know, that uh, we were going to go to Night Knoll San Antonio on Tuesday night, which was the day I was going. It was Tuesday. He said, you'd be welcome. You're more than welcome to join us. It'd be fun. And then you could stay over because on Wednesday, we're going to be coming to Houston and you can drive back with us. I said, oh, my gosh. So I did that. Um, and we joined for lunch. We got together for lunch and had a nice lunch. And then that evening, you know, Allison, my uh, Last week, my brother and sister-in-law were married 37 years. Wow. I, have, I had never, until that Tuesday evening when we went to Fiesta, that event, I had never um, and never done anything with them to, just socially mm-hmm. because they were at arm's length. At arm's length. Okay. I reconciled with my brother about three years ago. Uh, and, you know, we, we were friendly, but we still hadn't really socialized yeah. like that. Right. Wow. And then I and then I go that evening and stay at their home. Mm-hmm. And he is he's done real. I'm, oh, my gosh. He's done really well for himself. And we drive up and I knew it was going to be a nice home. I just thought inside and said, wow. And I was so excited for my brother. Yeah, you didn't feel less about yourself. You just it less, I and I wasn't that. jealous. I feel right? that, like y'all were both just being who you are and loving yep. and connecting from that place. Yep. Yeah, I can that's feel that re- through my whole body right now. And that's re- that's redemption. Yeah. Uh, and then the next day, they went with me to the school that I was going to visit, and and they got to see me in in my professional setting. Mm-hmm. And my brother was all excited because he did uh, he's never seen that. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing was when we were coming, and I'd asked him about an address. I said, do you know, and I forget the number. He says, do you know where 6,000 Mesa Street is? Uh, He says, oh, yeah, I know the neighborhood. I said, what kind of neighborhood is it? He says, well, it's it's a nice neighborhood. You know, yeah, it's a nice neighborhood. I said, okay. And that was it. Never any more questions or anything. When we were driving to Houston on the way, my sister-in-law in in the back seat says, why were you asking about 6,000 Mesa Street? And I said, well, funny you should ask that. I said, because um, that, that, do you remember Mark? And they said, Mark, I said, yeah, you know, he and I were together for a couple of years, right at the time that dad died, which was before I moved to Austin. And they said, yeah, I said, see, y'all never really saw him. And then we didn't hang out. And, and I said, but I said, you know, um, that relationship did not end well. Mm-hmm. I said, but I owe him an amends. I want to visit with him and tell him how very wrong I was for the way I treated him. And I said, you know, when I broke up, when we broke up, I went home to mother's that next morning, kind of crying. And my mother stuck out her finger. I don't know if you can see me on the camera. <laughs> yes. my, my mother sticks out this finger and she says, don't come to me. She says, you messed up the best thing that ever happened to you. Mm-hmm. Okay. And my mother had never talked to me that way. Well, on, on the ride home to, from, you know, from San Antonio back to Houston, I was telling them the story. And my brother is this big macho straight guy who I've certainly never talked about being gay with him. And in the car, that we were was having a conversation, not just that was basically talking about being gay, but a relationship I had and how my mother responded to that because I was the favorite child. Yeah. He had, oh, he had, he had just finished telling a story of how my mom, mom told me no, but she never told you no. And I said, exactly. <laughs> I said, you know, but so we're talking about that. And I thought that's redemption. That whole, those 24 hours or 36 hours of gym, I could celebrate with them and socialize and just laugh and have fun. And again, I did it without ever having a touch of alcohol. Uh, we do, were silly. We cracked cascarone on our head at the fiesta <laughs> and, you know, the, out at the park. Um, the next morning, they went with me to school and I could just tell that mm-hmm. he was, you know, proud and celebrate. And I was proud of his home. Oh, my gosh. I just so proud of what he has accomplished. Um, because again, he was the one that got told no, and I didn't, and I knew that, you know, in my sight, but to see him that he's done all this on his own. Um, and then that story and, and, and he has his big old truck. So we were in his truck cause he doesn't like to drive his wife's car. But anyway, so there we were. And then as I turned to look at him, as I was telling my story about Mark, there were tears running down mm-hmm. his cheek. I'm getting emotional now just thinking yeah. of that. So what does redemption look like? I can't talk about it necessarily, but that is what it looks like mm. that by by getting over my cheap self and just being authentic and just being just being i don't have a pot to piss in he's the one with all the money <laughs> right and it should be the other way around yeah. in one sense people would say well it's funny you're the doctor and all this stuff you went all the way with education you should yeah. have it and he didn't even go to college he was the black sheep of the family that didn't go to college but worked his butt off and look at what he has and his family is Oh my God, they're lovely. I was just so impressed to see his, who are grown now, 
who are now have their own children, etc. Mm -hmm. And the quality of their lives, how he has raised them is very evident, how they raised them. Um, and so all of those kind of things, and gosh, John, and it's funny, in, in the ride, when I went to bed that night, I said, I couldn't fall asleep. So I went for a walk around town here in my neighborhood. And first of all, I was back, glad to be back in Houston. I just love San Antonio. But I said, Houston is home. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's redemption because I can go into those situations that I never could before or that I would resist or purposefully avoid. And today I can go and I can be one with them. Mm -hmm. Right. And even though our, our stations in life, for lack of a better term, are so very different and, and not quite what you would ever have expected, but I'm okay with who I am mm -hmm. and I can celebrate with him with who he is. And in the well, midst of that, you know, I, we still, because they asked me about the school. I said, I want you to see the school because I think it'd be, per they had their grand, one of their grandchildren with them, a little boy who's about to turn three. I said, I, I think you'll like the school for him. And, and so it's all those kinds of things. But that is the end of, uh, not the end, it's in the midst of this ongoing journey. Because every day there's an opportunity to say, you know, John, you can run away, you can hide, you can avoid, or you can dismiss. Or you can have the courage that you talk about and the love and say, you know what, everyone, it's all about love. Mm -hmm. For me, it's either love or fear. Yep. Right? That's, that's yeah. it. It's either love or fear. And when I avoid you or dismiss you or deny you or, you know, avoid you, it's because there's some fear in there. And every night I go to bed, why did I deny? Why did mm -hmm. I avoid her? Why didn't I want to talk to them? What's the fear? John, get over your cheap self. And in the morning <laughs> you say hello. You know? I and love that's, that. That's that, that that's ongoing journey of redemption. Yeah. Um, and it has it has worked well for me in the sense of work wise, because people, I, the, you know, my productivity is good. And then the people say, God, I like dealing with you because you kind of tell me the truth, but you have a way about you. And, you know, I don't have to I just don't have to put on a, any kind of a show. I don't have to pretend. Yeah, I call that um, sacred. Like that's when we're being in our whatever vibration we're being at, we're going to get. So if we're being our cheap self and fake. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, or that segment. I love that term segmented. When we're being that segmented self, we're going to attract and create contracts with other segmented people, which is automatically there's going to be a lot of holes in that relationship. But when we're in our authentic selves, the energy that we put out is the same. And so we it it creates mutual, respectable, sacred contracts. Um you know, and we start having better work, not because of the amount of work, but because the people that we work with are aligned in the same energies. We, we may not even know, we may never, you may never have a discussion, but the people that you come in contact with are, are in a similar range of vibration at you and it creates satisfaction for both parties. Yeah, I, I yeah. so much agree with that. Yeah. that it's like the, the marketing thing. Yeah. I, I do. I really don't do any marketing. I, I had done this. Uh, what, what is that thing where you send out all these emails and you get a master list and all that? Oh, yeah. and I did all, the, all, the, all the professors in Texas. And I didn't get squat out of that. Yeah. But, you know, I, friends who had uh, who I colleagues, former colleagues from mm -hmm. uh, in the education field said, you know, I have someone who works for me who's going through. What do you think? And then once I got there. Uh, their dissertation uh, got them through their dissertation they said wow you know i have a friend who's in the same boat i am would you mind if i gave them your number yep. and so it's that word of mouth referral type thing and because again it was not i think it's a, the balance of who i am as person and who i am as professional and and it's that balance says here's what it is i don't and i don't i really don't talk about it and that's 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 so to speak the you know the, the synergy uh, 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 and synchronicity I love that word synchronicity where it just, it all happens. And it be, it begins because in the morning I wake up and say, okay, John, get over your cheap self and be good. <laughs> be good. Be kind, John. And, you know, I see people who I don't kind of say, I'm not going to talk to them because they look, you know, they look whatever. And I said, you know, that who knows what the hell they're going through, number one. And I said, we're all going through something. Yeah, we're all, we're going, all through something. going through something. You know, I love to talk about my work because I love what I do. But the truth is, I should have more. Or not I should. I would love to have more because financially, I'm not nearly as secure as I used to be. And I would love to have financial security. And that's a regular challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, in a couple of days, in what, what's today, the 11th? 
12, today's the 12. 12 so in yeah. four days, in four days, I turned 59. And I said, hell boy, you ain't no kid anymore. And so, you know, <laughs> re- retirement and all those kind of stuff, you know, so I, you know, financial security plagues yeah. me. It, it is, it mm. plagues me daily. Um, so, and, but, but even in the midst of that, I can still go bed at, to bed at night and say, okay, how were you today? You know, how did you treat others? Yeah. How did you treat yourself? You know, um, another thing like the Dalai Lama, I used to think, uh, you know, I used to take great pride that I would stay up till one in the morning. I'm going to show you because I'm good and I can work till one in the morning <laughs> and, I still would, and I still would be up at five in the morning. So I would brag about, you know, what, four or five hours of sleep. And then my body, there was something going on and it wasn't what a doctor or anything I read, but I did come across something from um, the Dalai Lama that says, you know, you know what the Dalai Lama says about meditation? What the the best meditation is sleep. Yep. Yep. So thank you. Thank you, Dalai Lama. And so, you know, it's those kind of things that, that made that connection and said, okay, John, get over your cheap self. Don't set the alarm because you know, you have the flexibility of working yeah. now. So some days, you know, I'm up at 10 PM with my laptop and I'm working on a project and the next morning, like this morning, cause I knew this was going to happen at 11. Well, even though I woke up, I kind of rolled around in bed till eight 30 which was really nice. Right. Um, and, you know, so those kind of things. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's a life of joy. Mm-hmm. And here's the deal about joy. I love, I thank you so much for saying that you see joy because that's what I, I work I, It comes, yeah, right? it really comes through. But, but, here, but here's what it is for me. You know, joy, joy is not every day, right? That's not 24-7. No, um, right. Because, you know, life, I mean, Buddhism tells us that life is, is a struggle. And it's how we respond to the pain, how we respond mm-hmm. to the struggle, and then make of ourselves. Yeah. So joy for me is like twinkly lights. It happens here and there. And then mm-hmm. you string them together and you sit in that backyard and you say, oh, my God, that is so cruel. Yeah. You know, I, have so a, I have a coach that says life is 50% good and 50% shit. And I've realized like when we're convincing ourselves that there's a place to get to and then everything will be okay. Or that when it's always joyful, that's, that's, just, that's another way of numbing and another way of buffering. Um, and this goes, this actually speaks to that security thing. We could have a whole nother call about that. And we're, we're getting close to we're we're over time, but that's okay with me. Um, oh my gosh. I want you, you should, to know. You should talk a lot. Alex. I know. I want you to know. <laughs> I want you to know though, John, uh, my friend, Michelle Bauman, who um, has passed away a couple years ago, but Michelle Bauman used to be a lawyer and she ended up becoming a coach. And I learned this from her because she was really big into needing financial security. And she had been a lawyer and was leaving that lucrative career to do this kind of work. And someday it hit her that her resilience, her resilience was her security. It was never the money in the bank, the resilience. And that's as you sit here and tell me all these stories, you have reinvented yourself over and over again until you found the true self. And so the resilience, your resilience will create that security more than any amount put in that bank. And um, I, I just, I love the resilience. And for those of us to not give up in that quest, even if we don't know it, like we don't know that we're on this quest to discover who we are. I always call a midlife crisis a midlife awakening. And I I was thinking about your word redemption. Um, I'd be curious to look up the etymology of the word, but in my experience of your stories today, redemption is the ability to return and remember who you are, capital A-R-E, or who you be is how I say it with intentionally incorrect grammar remember who you be and extend that gift to those around you and then it reflects back so it is both the giving and the receiving of just being who you are Mm -hmm. because if we give that to others without giving it to ourselves it's that empty vessel that you talked about so to me that's what I'm, i'm redemption is just the, the willingness to be who you are and give that to somebody and the experience you had with your brother in the car is just two souls being who they be without needing when we don't need somebody else to be. So one of my um, best friends, like on my one hand, best friends is Varian Brandon and Varian's uh, I've done a, a, she wasn't on the show technically, but she's been an episode, a bonus episode. And she came to speak and Varian is a very, committed evangelical Baptist Christian. 
who does not philosophically agree with some of the things I do. And yet Varian at Camp Starheart was telling people, I have, you know, these various programs and I have one specific program that is like for witchy women. It's like all about how to build your psychic gifts. It's totally pagan. Okay. It's totally pagan. It's not Christian. And Varian is saying, you need to do this thing with Allison. And I just look at her like, you don't believe in that though. And she goes, but I believe in you. And it's the same kind of ridiculous. Like I just get chills in my whole body that, that she loves herself enough and loves her faith enough to not project it onto me. Yeah. She owns her faith. So she has been somebody that has given me the gift, uh, especially from the religious world and the spirit, well, not spiritual world, but from the religious and the, the boundaries around a specific religion. She's somebody that's given me the gift of being that within, while maintaining her spirituality, letting me be who I was. So it makes me feel it's, it's just, then it's just, we, we do, we do this dance and we've done this dance of friendship that is just delicious because I don't need to be anything other than me. She, she has a little, um, she's like, Oh, Allison loves dogs. And I don't Allison cusses and I never will. Allison, and used to be a Christian and I always am and and she's black and I'm white and you know we kind of use all of our polarities and I asked her one day I said does it bother you that we kind of have this foundation of the polarity in the story and she goes no I love it like like you know I didn't want to pigeonhole us into this certain relationship and it is just like your you know it's this evidence this it's this social proof right same thing as like being the PhD being the doctor it's this social proof that two people who have some very different beliefs and values can find kindness and connection that betroths us together in an intimate friendship. And we don't have to, we don't have to be, you know, we don't, we don't have to be segmented. She doesn't have to keep her Christian self and I don't have to keep my witchy woman self. Um, I don't have to, you know, she would always get not mad, but she, cause she doesn't really get mad, but she would be like, Y'all stop trying to filter around me. I don't cuss, but I don't care if you do. I'm not offended by your language. She goes, I'm more offended if you, you know, I'm going to use your word, but I'm more offended if you segment yourself for me. And so those, that's, I love that thought of redemption. And after this call, I'm going to look it up. So to end, let's do this. Um, For the people listening, I am going to ask John to send me some information about the specific work you do editing these dissertations um, and get all your professional information so that we can put that in the show notes on the web page so that if if people want to contact you professionally or want to contact you personally or, you know, if they want to have access to get to know you, we'll, we'll put that stuff. I'll get you to send that to me after the show and that will be on the show notes. And then the other thing I want to know, John, as you have your 59th birthday on the 16th from that place of wisdom and redemption and this quilted spirituality. What is the one thing you want people listening or watching to remember for their life journey? Oh my goodness. It's only by being of value to the world. Hmm that we can be, it is only, we can, uh, let me rephrase that. We can only be of value to the world by being, by valuing ourselves. Yeah. We can Mm. only be of value. And that's to me is the ultimate to be of value to the world. But I have no value if I do not value myself. Are we absolutely finished? Um, Almost. I'm just taking that in because it's so, it's such a, you know, you hear be you put all over the world. Yeah. You, you know, you hear that phrase a lot. Yeah. yeah. So be of value. We can only be of value to the to world. The world. By, when we value by, by or, yeah, by valuing ourselves. And I love the extension. And it's all that self-love. And, yeah. Well, the extension too, because so many people say, you know, we hear this in coaching, like, how do you get clients? You go out and serve and you go out and serve and you go out and serve and you go and take care of other people. And I was actually just talking with my doctor the other day and she looks at me and she says, you're taking care of everybody else. And she says, I know I do it too. And, and, you know, we, we go out and we serve everybody else, but if we don't value ourselves, there's nothing left to give. And if we, if we do, Oh, and I just, I'm in love with this segmented 
the segmented thing. Cause one of the things I do in coaching is I actually ask my client, I teach my clients to go Sybil on themselves. I want them to recognize the different personalities because most of them don't. So again, another story. Thank you so much for being here um, with us for being on the show. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. I just, yeah, it, it was nice to reflect in preparation for, and it was nice just to uh, say it out loud to articulate uh, the gift that has been given to me by getting over my cheap self. <laughs> just, that, even the way you say that, like get over your cheap self. I've never seen you as cheap, right? Like that's, it's almost the opposite is like get over your fancy pants self and just be you. But I love that you call it your cheap self. Mm-hmm. You are a treasure. I'm thankful to have you in my mm-hmm. life then and thankful Likewise. to know you now. And it's fun to watch. Um, it's fun to watch your journey in our dance and see where your bike will take you next. Um, obviously here on Facebook, you can see John Steven Cisneros. Um, you can I don't know if you're open to friend requests. You don't have to accept them. Absolutely. If Absolutely. you did watch or listen, feel free to put comments, um, what your thoughts are or any questions you have in the, in the comment section. Um, same thing on the podcast. You can come to the podcast show notes and, um, and connect with um, John or myself there. Thank you for being here. And now we are officially done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>